Welcome to the Creek Road Baptist Pulpit. These weekly podcasts feature expository messages delivered to edify the soul. Now let's join Pastor Dave as he presents this week's message. If you have your Bible there, why don't you turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 24. We're going to begin our reading in verse 15 today. But before we read the passage, I think we need to do a little background. Let me give you some background before we read today. And a little, um, just a little bit about where we've been and where we're going to go. So we've been in this series on the Spirit of God in the Old Testament. We've been to creation and saw the Spirit of God hovering over the waters, the great dark deep of creation. We've seen the good works and gifts of the Spirit in Joseph. In Genesis chapter 41, the effectual calling and gifts of the Spirit in Bezalel. In, uh, what was that number, or Exodus. And then the revelatory work of the Spirit of God in Balaam, there in Numbers. The fruit of the Spirit in the story of Saul and Nahash last week in 1 Samuel. And today, here in 2 Chronicles, uh, we move ahead in time to the story of Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, and we see the ministry of the Holy Spirit to convince and convict. So we're going to read about that today. And today's Pentecost, or this weekend is Pentecost, and so this will bring to a close this series of messages on the Spirit of God in the Old Testament. So the background here of where we are here in 2 Chronicles chapter 24 we're here with Joash and Jehoiada. The story you know, demonstrated the wonderful way that God oversees all things for his people. And we're reading here in 24, and we're going to begin in 15, but you have to go back to chapter 21, because in chapter 21, we have the ascension of a man named Jehoram to the throne of Judah. Jehoram was the son of Jehoshaphat. Now, we know Jehoshaphat, he was a good king, but Jehoram, not so much. I don't know what happened to his son, but something happened to his son, and he was not a good king in Israel. Jehoshaphat was a good king, but his son was terribly wicked. And as a matter of fact, he married the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel, a, a girl named Athaliah. So he marries Athaliah, and he was so bad that the Lord sent a letter to him by the hand of Elijah, which you have there in 21, 12 through 15. And Elijah said, you know, you, you're the son of a good man, but you've not acted good, and kind of warned him there. The scripture says of Jehoram that he reigned in Jerusalem eight years, and I think maybe this is one of the saddest, and this will, I'll add this to my saddest statements in the Bible, He reigned in Jerusalem eight years and departed without being desired. Everyone was glad when he was gone. That's how bad Jehoram was. That's 2 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 20. So his son Ahaziah comes to the throne in chapter 22, and he too, like his father, was evil, but he only reigned one year, and upon his death, his mother, Athaliah, takes the throne. And when she comes to the throne, she slays all of Ahaziah's children. So all of her grandchildren, she kills every one of them. All of her grandchildren are killed. But one of the boys was rescued by the family of the high priest, a man known as Jehoiada. Now Jehoiada, we're going to begin in fifteen, in 2415, and we begin with his death. But at this time, when uh, Joash was just a little baby boy, he is rescued by Jehoiada's wife, and, they, and he is taken into the temple. So Jehoiada and Jehoshabeth hid the child for six years in the temple. Six years. He couldn't let anybody know that this boy was alive because Athaliah was on the throne for six years. In chapter 23, Jehoiada strengthens himself and puts in place a plan to bring the young boy to the throne and to remove Athaliah. Of course, the young child, this boy, has the birthright. 
He's the one that should be king. As a matter of fact, he's the only one that could be king because she had seen to it that all the rest of those boys were slaughtered. So there's only one left. God, God uh, left a lamp in Israel for David, but it was only one light, and that was this little boy, Joash. So he puts this plan in place, and then the plan succeeds, in chapter 23, we're told about the plan and how it all came, you know, um, worked out. The plan succeeds. And then in chapter 24, we have this. Joash was seven years old when he began to reign. This is verse 1 in chapter 24. Joash was seven years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name also was Zibia of Beersheba. And Joash did which was right in the eyes in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. So Joash led the people to repair the house of the Lord, and he was very zealous for its repair. And this good behavior um, was wonderful. As a matter of fact, he, you know, he told the high priest Jehoiada, his, his mentor, his, his guardian, once he's king, he says, why haven't you repaired the house of the Lord? He really wanted that done. And then he's the one that puts together the chest with the hole in the top. You know, in Jesus' day, when, they, when he's standing by the treasury and the people are casting in, they're casting into a treasure chest. And, you know, the little widow woman comes and she puts in her might. They're casting into a treasure chest that uh, Joash created. So this little treasure chest, he puts it by the gate and the people cast into it so that the temple can be repaired because Athaliah, the wicked queen, had completely destroyed the temple and taken out of the temple all the articles that were necessary for the worship of God and sent them to the temple of Baal. So he's repairing the temple. He's very zealous for that. But this good behavior lasted only while Jehoiada lived. The statement in verse 2 Turns out to be very telling. There in verse 2 it says, He did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada. Joash did good up until the death of Jehoiada. And that's where we enter the story here in verse 15. Okay, so 2 Chronicles chapter 24 verses 15 and 16. Let me turn back over there. But Jehoiada waxed old and was full of days when he died. A hundred and thirty years old was he when he died. And they buried him in the city of David among the kings because he had done good in Israel, both towards God and toward his house. Now after the death of Jehoiada came the princes of Judah and made obeisance to the king. Then the king hearkened unto them. And they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served the groves and idols. And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this their trespass. Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them again unto the Lord. But they testified against them, and they testified against them, but they would not give ear. And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, son of Jehoiada the priest, which stood above the people and said to them, Thus saith God, Why trans... Why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord, that ye cannot prosper? Because you have forsaken the Lord, he has forsaken you. And they conspired against him, and stoned him with stones in the com at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of the Lord. Thus Joash the king remembered not the kindness which Jehoiada his father had done to him, but slew his son. And when he died, he said, The Lord look upon it and require it. Notice that we have here the death of Jehoiada begins this right away. He waxed old, was full of days. I would imagine 130 years old, you could say he was full of days. And he did, he did something that no other person had done. They buried him in the tombs of the kings. Notice that. In the city of David among the kings because he had done good in Israel. If it wasn't for Jehoiada and the hand of God on this man... Everything would have been lost. He, what he did was worthy, really, of being buried amongst the kings. And he did good, it says, in Israel, both towards God and towards his house. So Jehoiada was quite a man. I'm sure he was celebrated. I'm sure that this was, this was a celebration that lasted many days. 
He, he's waxed old and he passes away. And then we have verse 24, uh, chapter 24, verse 17. Now after the death of Jehoiada. So something changes. Jehoiada's gone. Something is going to change. And it had to come after. This change had to come after the death of Jehoiada. Because this young man, Joash, had enjoyed the godly influence of Jehoiada for all of his life. No one else would have had his ear. No one else could have had his ear. He was as a father to Joash. Jehoiada was. Now we read here in verse 17, now after the death of Jehoiada, these words mark a drastic change in the life of the king and of the nation. The steady hand of the grand old man was gone. Unless the people and the king had paid attention and adopted the convictions of this man, things would begin to backslide, and they did. Because apparently the leadership had paid little attention and had little concern for all the convictions that Jehoiada had shared with them. Notice that the weakness of the king is exposed here. After the death of Jehoiada came the princes of Judah and made obeisance to the king. These are men of his age probably. Some older, some younger, but probably men of his age. The finest of the nations. They're not his brothers because Athaliah had taken care of that. All the, all the brothers of, of Joash were dead. She had slain all of them except for him. So these are not his brothers, but these are princes. They are the leaders in the countryside. They're the governors, and they're the lieutenants, and they're the captains. These are the princes in Judah, and they come there to the capital in Jerusalem, and they're leaders in the nation, men with you know learned opinions. They're probably well-dressed. They're probably well-spoken. They're the finest of the nation. And notice how they approach him. They made obeisance to the king. Now, the, the Hebrew here is in the causative form. And in the causative form, you would roughly translate this. They caused themselves to bow before the king. Which I think suggests to me that they really didn't want to do this. They really didn't want to bow down before him. But because they, uh, you know... They needed something from him. They did it. They didn't like his religious views up to this point. <clears throat> he was very zealous for the temple. He wanted the sacrifices of God to continue. That's why he does all the work that he does to revive and restore the temple. But these men come and they make themselves to bow before the king. They didn't like who raised him, apparently. They didn't like Jehoiada. They didn't like the king's work to destroy, to restore the temple, etc. But to get what they wanted, they were willing to show respect that they didn't have. So they're hypocrites. They're playing a part. They're all dressed up. They're speaking well. They're looking well. They're sounding well. They're smelling well. All the, you know, everything that you would want. And they're saying just the right things to King Joash. They bow themselves down and make obeisance to him. And they make themselves do it because probably they weren't on his side. These are your hypocrites. But what does Joash see? Does Joash see a bunch of hypocrites bowing before him there? No. Joash entertains these pretenders. Notice there it says, Then the king hearkened unto them. Maybe he knew their views and the spirit of Athaliah that they kept alive. But because they showed respect toward him, he tried to meet them halfway. Yeah, they, they came in there and they bowed down before him. And, and Joash must have thought, whoa, these guys never would have bowed before me, you know, when Jehoiada was alive. But now they do. Maybe they think I'm somebody. You know, maybe now they're showing me the respect that I deserve. I'm the king. I'm on the throne. And here they are bowed down before me. Yeah, I like this. And so because of that, his heart is tendered toward them, and he wants to meet them halfway. Whatever they want to say now, he's going to listen to them. But it's worse than that, because he didn't listen with a discerning ear. 
He opened his heart to the possibility of all that they said. He entertained their ideas and allowed them to tempt him and allow their obeisance to play to his pride. He wasn't cautious. He wasn't, he wasn't wary. He didn't see the hypocrites in the fine clothing. He heard their words and he was tempted because they were, they were playing to his pride. And he allowed this, ladies and gentlemen, to open his ears and his heart to what they had to say. Athaliah, even though she's dead, and she's been dead now for some time, but all of a sudden now she's threatening the throne again. The victory she couldn't get while alive, she is achieving through these men. You see, because Joash had not prepared his heart for this. He wasn't ready for this. He had had plenty of time to get ready for this. All his life up to this moment has been the time when he could have prepared his heart for what was going to happen in that throne room, but he hadn't done it. He depended upon Jehoiada and Jehoshabeth to shield him and to know what to do and to advise him. He had not learned the lessons of faithfulness to the Lord or how to walk in the way of the Lord. This kind of laziness today is rampant in the church. We just allow others to lead us along, but when they're gone, what happens? What happens to the church? Leaders then start taking the church in other directions. Christian homes and families start going in opposite directions because they haven't taken the time to learn the lessons that they need to learn. And this is what's happening here. Joshua, jo, Joash has not prepared his heart, and now the moment comes, and he's in jeopardy. He is in jeopardy because he doesn't know what to do. And it all sounds so good, and they're playing to his pride. So guess what the next word is? Yes, and please, and okay. And you know what? That sounds reasonable, and let's do that. Because he doesn't know to say no to these men. He doesn't realize that they're hypocrites. He doesn't see through their disguise. If Jehoiada had been there, well, first of all, they never would have shown up. But if Jehoiada had been there, he could have seen through their disguise. What's the difference? Jehoiada had prepared his heart while Joash hadn't. Matthew Henry has this little piece in his commentary that I just loved. He said, let me quote him, quote, Men may go far in the external performances of religion. And keep long to them, merely by the power of the education and the influence of their friends, who yet have no hearty affection for divine things, nor any inward relish of them. Foreign inducements may push men on to that which is good, who are not actuated by a living principle of grace in their hearts. And that's exactly what we have with Joash, is that we have foreign inducements. Jehoiada was a foreign inducement in the life of Joash because he had never, ever been actuated by a living principle of grace in his heart. And so once the inducement, Jehoiada, is gone, he's left to his own devices. He's adrift because he has no guide. He has no north star. He has nothing to give him direction. And so he just drifts off into heresy. Foreign inducements may push men on to that which is good who are not actuated by a living principle of grace in their hearts. Boy, that's so good. And he's so true. And we see it right here with Joash. Suddenly, Jehoiada's gone. These fellows come in, play to his pride, and because he's not prepared himself by a living principle of grace, he'll do whatever. And notice what the whatever is. Verse 18. They left the house of the Lord God of their fathers. They left. Now, Joash had been doing what to the Lord's house? He'd been repairing it, restoring it, you know, recreating all the instruments that they needed that Athaliah had taken out. He'd been doing all of that, but now they leave? Well, it's worse than that. This is the worst insult of all, maybe. After all that Joash had done to repair the house and restore the daily sacrifice. And the Hebrew word left here, it's translated left in the King James, 
carries, a much, carries much more weight than the English word left actually conveys to us. The, the Hebrew word here suggests that they abandoned it. They left it behind or gave up on it. And in another place here in our text, the translators are going to translate this forsaken. They have forsaken the house of God, so they completely turned their back on it. How could we go from Jehoiada's death to them forsaking the house of the Lord just like that? How is that possible? It's possible because there wasn't a living principle of grace in the heart of this king. That's why it's possible. He didn't have his north star any longer, and he hadn't done anything to prepare himself for this day. And so these men come in with their pomp and their circumstance and all their obeisance and their lovely flowery language, and then suddenly Joash forsakes the house of the Lord. But it's even worse than that. And he served groves and idols. Notice that there in verse 18. They left the house of the Lord, their God of their fathers, and served groves and idols. When you leave off the worship of God, something else will fill the void, and it is never something good. Always something else rushes in and demands to be worshipped. Something appealing, something that tickles, something that satisfies pride and passion. Always. There is never a time when you can just be agnostic or atheistic. There's never a time when you can say, oh, I don't need that. I'll just live my, my life like normal. No, no, no. Always something demands our worship. Something demands our time. Something is asking for worship. And, of course, Joash wasn't ready, so he goes off and he serves groves and idols because he had to have something in his life to replace what he had just forsaken. And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this their trespass. Are we at all surprised by this last statement? I'm sure they asked the question, why do bad things happen to good people? They were probably crying about the wrath that came upon them. But it's their fault. Where are the good people in this? They're not there. Because they've left off serving the Lord. They've left off the house of the Lord. And they've gone off to serve idols. So guess what? They're going to get exactly what they want, or what they don't want, but that's what they really want. And then we have verse 19. <laughs> I love verse 19 because we can preach, we can preach the, the, the idiocy of all that's happened up to this point, the laziness of Joash, the, the, the need he's had up until the moment when Jehoiada dies to have prepared his heart, but he didn't do it. We can preach all of that. But, and, and we come to this place, and, Judah came, and you know, wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem, and we say, you know, that's it, there you go. But that's not it, because then we have the grand adversative there in 19. But, or some of your translations will say, yet, God is long-suffering towards us, and his mercy here is demonstrated in verse 19. Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them again unto the Lord. How wonderful this is. The mercy of God is multiplied in the word prophets. Notice it's many. Prophets were coming and coming and coming, and they're telling the people, all you have to do is turn your hearts back to the Lord. That's all you have to do. And the mercy of God is expressed in this. He's waiting for them to reply to him. He's waiting for them to come back to him, and he's sending prophets to them. Notice that it's to them. Who's the them? Well, you go back to, you know, the very beginning of the story. After the death of um, Jehoiada, the princes of Judah came and made obeisance to the king, and the king hearkened unto them. So the them here is the princes of Judah, it's the king, and probably some of the people that have joined in with them. Because these are the leaders, so apparently, you know, probably some folk that have gone off with them. So he sent prophets to them, to the king, to the princes, and to the people. Many prophets came to return them to the Lord. That's that word there, to bring them again. That's the Hebrew word for to return. 
It's always used in this, well, not always, but it's, it's often used with this idea of returning spiritually, returning, so the heart's turning. It's, this is the word for repentance. So these prophets are preaching repentance. Turn again unto the Lord, leave off the idols, so that the king and his new counselors and the people that they were leading astray might return to the worship and shelter of God Almighty. And how long did this go on? We don't know. It doesn't tell us. But no doubt it went on for quite a while. Prophets were coming and preaching. Prophets were coming and preaching even more. Coming and preaching. All of them coming with a message of repentance. Come again. Turn again. Come back to the Lord. And they testified against them. But they would not give ear. It's never easy when the preached word calls for repentance, is it? It's never easy when the preach word calls for repentance, and especially when the subject of that repentance is me. The prophets were pointing out exactly what was going on in the nation and in the lives of the people, and no doubt what was going on in the palace. Don't you know the king hated to hear the prophets because I'm sure that as he listened to these men preach, he's thinking of who? He's thinking of Jehoiada. He's thinking of that sweet wife of his, Jehoshabeth. And he's thinking of all the lessons that he learned at her knee. And he's thinking of all the things that he was taught by this man of God. And he's thinking of all of that and how he's rejected it. And it must have turned bitter in his mouth to think of all that he rejected But in the midst of that bitterness, he's thinking of all of his pleasure that he's having now, worshiping Baal and the groves. And so there must have been a great conflict in this man's heart. But they would not give ear. Yeah. The King James Version here has this translation spot on, I think. They would not give ear. That's exactly the way the Hebrew lines it up. Conveys it perfectly. What were they giving their ears to, though? If they weren't listening to the prophets, if they wouldn't give their ears to the prophets, what were they listening to? Not to the preaching of the word of God. They turned their ears from that. Who wants to hear a message of repentance when you're having such a wonderful time? Verse 20. And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest. At this critical moment, when the Lord is sending his prophets in, he now sends his Spirit. Remember, the Spirit is the one that proceeds. God sends it. Jesus sends it. The Spirit's proceeding from God and being placed upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, He sends his spirit on this man to bring the word in power to the king, to the princes, and to the people. They wouldn't listen to the word faithfully preached by the ordinary means. So now the power of God descends on Jehoiada's son. And this must have had a profound impact on Joash. Because Jehoiada's son is now saying the same things that his father had said. Here's our doctrine. This is what the Spirit of God does. We've seen the Spirit of God producing fruit. We've seen him producing good works. We've seen him producing gifts. We've seen him hovering over the dark deep in creation and doing his creative work there, the same work that he does in the hearts of men yet today. And now we see the Spirit of God doing the work in which Jesus tells us that it's going to do. If you look in John chapter 16, I mean, we'll have no better commentator on this than the Lord Jesus himself. John chapter 16, verses 17 through 15, Jesus tells the disciples, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. 
I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he sh shall hear, that shall he speak, and he shall show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore I said that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. This is the work and ministry of the Spirit of God. One of the many things that we have studied, and now here we see it exactly as it is in uh, Joash's story. So the preaching of the prophets should have tendered the hearts of these men, but it didn't. It should have tendered the hearts of these men so that when the spirit-empowered preaching of Zechariah came, a great revival would have broken out in Jerusalem and Judah. But it didn't because they had hardened their hearts. They hadn't listened to the word of God. They hadn't listened to the prophets that God had sent. And now when the spirit of God comes and it's the moment of revival, their hearts are hard and they break instead of being mended. Just like what happened to Pharaoh. Pharaoh listened to Moses. All that time he listened to Moses, and he could have. He could have, but he didn't, because instead of his heart being tendered by the word that Moses spoke, it was hardened until finally it broke. And that's what's happening here in Joash's life. The Spirit of God comes, Jesus says, to reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. What's happening here in this story? Exactly that. The Spirit of God is pointing out sin. Notice what he says. Why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord that you cannot prosper? The Spirit of God pointing out sin. Notice here when he says that. This is his sermon. I'm sure that you all would long for a sermon this short. He says, why transgress ye the commands of the Lord that you cannot prosper? This is a message of exclusivity. There is no prosperity apart from the Lord. There is no salvation, no favor, no redemption, no justification, no adoption as sons, no freedom, no transformation, no eternal life, no hope for this life or for the next. The Lord doesn't say through Zechariah that it's okay. He doesn't pat them on the head and wink at their sin. No, he says, why do you transgress the commandments? The exclusive gospel always calls men and women to account, always calls for repentance from sin. It doesn't include the bales and the groves. It says, get that junk out of your life. That's what it says. It says it's a sin to follow those things. Don't do it. Always, always the Spirit of God comes with this exclusive message always calls for repentance from sin and always says that Jesus is the only way. And here it is again. We have it through Zechariah. This is the only way. Why are you transgressing? So that you cannot prosper. They're thinking to themselves, we're prospering just fine. We're having a grand old time in our sin. Spirit of God comes in judgment. Look at the next phrase. Because you have forsaken the Lord, he has forsaken you. Here's the judgment. Because the, because the spirit of this world has been judged. We don't need to wait around and ask, well, let's see what the Lord's decision is. We already know it because he's already given it to us. The spirit of God comes and he takes that judgment and he says, here it is. You've sinned because you've forsaken the Lord. He has forsaken you. We don't need to ask if it's okay to serve the bells. We know it's wrong. We have, that. we have that in the commandments. You shall serve no other gods but me, he says. We don't have to wonder if adultery is okay because we have that in the commandments. The judgment's already been given. We don't have to worry about murder if that's right or wrong because we have it in the commandments. We don't have to worry about, you know, is it right or wrong to take the Lord's name in vain? We have that in the commandments. We have it all. We have all of it. And so now here comes the Spirit of God and he brings this. They already knew it. But they had forgotten it. Because you had forsaken the Lord, he has forsaken you. Here we have the same word in verse 18 that is translated left. And so in the mouth of Zechariah, he tells them exactly what they had done. You have forsaken the Lord, so he has forsaken you. And here we have it twice. 
The judgment of heaven is rendered by the man of God filled with the spirit of God, preaching the word of God. The world doesn't want the certainty of heaven's pronouncement but want something to be left up to us to decide. Let's have our own will. Let's have our own way. We don't want to hear the word of God preached. The world cries out, my choice, my truth, my way, my love, my wants, my will. But the Spirit of God tells us judgment has been rendered. So what happens? What could have happened was that the Spirit of God hovering over the dark deep of these men brings light and transformation, but they'd hardened their hearts so much through the preaching of the prophets that they didn't. And now notice what happens. Verse 21, they conspired against him. Remember that the they remains the king and his counselors and probably some of the people. Right here we want things to turn around, right? Because the Spirit of God has proceeded from God you know, the dark deep of Joash and Judah will now see the light. And they did see the light, actually, because the word of God, the spirit of God took the word of God and preached through the man of God. So there was light there, but they rejected it. The spirit of God on the man of God who spoke the word of God brought light and all they needed to know. But this resistance points out the corruption of the human heart. And ladies and gentlemen, this is where we are today. That's where we've always been, really. You notice the very next thing it says? They stoned him with stones. Tell me exactly what was Zechariah's crime. What had he done to deserve a stoning? <clears throat> stoning was normally reserved for someone who had committed a great sin against God and the people. I mean, the, probably the most famous stoning we have in the Bible is the stoning of Achan there in the Valley of Achor. They stoned him and his family. Joshua chapter 7, but he had, com he had committed a great sin. What had, what had Zechariah done? All he had done is preach the word of God. Yeah, the watchword today is tolerance in our society and in our culture, but they are far from tolerant. It's only the approved speech that is tolerated. It is not the truth. And not only did they stone this man to death, but they did it, notice, at the commandment of the king. What has happened to Joash? He has turned away completely from Jehoiada's gracious leadership, from his devotion to the Lord, and he has turned to Athaliah's way. We have entered such a time. The madness of our day would destroy anyone who would stand for righteousness. Wokeness, as it is so-called today, will not be challenged, and it demands of everyone acceptance. We are to make obeisance before the mob today. So why would corporations such as the L.A. Dodgers and Target and Bud Light and Miller Light and so forth say the things that they've recently said that have lately been reported? Because they're afraid of this very same thing happening to them. They want to do obeisance to the mob before it gets to them. So that every mob will say, oh yeah, we like these guys. The commandment of the king. And that, notice that, I mean, we just keep getting worse here. Number one, they stoned him. Number two, they stoned him at the commandment of the king. But then, where did they stone him? Between the altar and the house of the Lord. The house of the Lord was where Joshua was hid, or Joash was hid. The house of the Lord was the place that he had worked so diligently to repair and restore. This was the house of the Lord. He was hid in the house of the Lord six years while Athaliah reigned over the land. Now he takes Jehoiada's son and stones him there in the court of the house of the Lord, right before the very temple of God. They don't care. What a complete reversal. This says more about the failure and fall of Joash than anything else. He had not prepared his heart. And ladies and gentlemen, we might poo-poo all of that and say, well, it's not really necessary for me to study. It's not really necessary for me to know what I believe. It's not really necessary for me to accept you know, the, the old landmarks. It's not necessary for me. to. Yes, it is. Because if you don't, one day all those things will be gone and you'll be left going, well, what do I do now? Know now what you're going to do. Understand 
walking with the Lord. Understand the way of the Lord. Because if you don't, this is what it comes to. And notice how quickly. Verse 22. Thus Joash the king remembered not the kindness which Jehoiada his father had done unto him, but slew his son. This is what willful sinning does to the soul. Every good deed, every faithful word and work must be brought into the service of the new master of the heart. If they cannot be, then they must be rejected and killed off so that those good memories, deeds, words, works will not interfere with the worship of the new idol. It all must go. And so Joash doesn't remember all that Jehoiada did, but slew his son. And then we have there in verse uh, 22 at the end, and when he died... He said, the Lord look upon it and require it. This is remembered by Christ, by the way, in the Gospel of Luke. In Luke uh, 11, verses 49 through 50. Therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles. Some of them they shall slay and persecute. That the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, which perished between the altar and the temple. Verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. Well, let me conclude today. Number one, I'm going to give you six things to remember. Remember number one, remember to prepare your heart because the princes of Judah will come and visit you too. They will. They will tell you many things that you had better be prepared to answer. This is your responsibility to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And, ladies and gentlemen, remember that you must know your own weaknesses because they will try to exploit them. Number two, remember that the the downgrade streams away from the truth at lightning speed. We see this happening today, and we see it worst of all in churches. In churches where the word of God is now being condemned and set aside for the opinions of men. Now that's always been going on, but it is happening today in churches across our convention and across evangelicalism in, uh, in general in just astounding ways. Downgrade always streams away from the truth at lightning speed, and man, is it happening today. We must be ready. We must remember that this is always a problem. It's a problem today. Number three, remember that the Lord is long-suffering. This always makes me smile. His mercy is everlasting. He does not give up on us, but continues to call us to repentance. Do not despise his mercy. Number four, remember that the Spirit of God will give you the strength to proclaim the exclusive gospel to a generation that accepts all foolishness and calls it wisdom. The Spirit of God will give you strength to proclaim the exclusive gospel, but ladies and gentlemen, sometimes instead of revivals, what you get are stones, so just be ready for that. Because a generation that accepts foolishness and calls it wisdom will not put up with an exclusive gospel because they want to include everybody. They want a rainbow coalition that includes everybody. Just bring them all in. No, we're not going to worship the groves and the idols. Remember number five. Remember that a message of judgment was inspired by the Spirit of God in Zechariah's heart and will be published by the church to the corrupt culture in which it finds itself. This is the ministry of the Spirit. The Spirit of God has come for sin, righteousness, and judgment. All of those are going to be proclaimed. And this generation doesn't have the time or the internal fortitude to put up with a message about righteousness. It will not listen to a message of repentance from sin and to righteousness or holiness. It will not put up with any of that because the message of tolerance today is intolerance, actually. And finally, number six, remember that the reprobate reprobate mind, which has fully embraced sin, such as Joash's, will not stand for a telling of the truth. They will not stand for rational debate, but rather will call for the destruction of anything, anyone, any church, 
any society that does not do obeisance to them. That is where we are today. Jesus will meet you. Thanks for listening to this week's message. Please join us again next time for another installment of the Creek Road Baptist Pulpit.